verse 254. Delusion itself is no more than truth. Truth is neither in samskara nor anywhere else, but it is where samskara is observed. So delusion itself is no more than truth. What's the point of that? What's the point of this? Delusion itself is no more than truth. Surely there's delusion and we need to move away from delusion towards truth. This is the usual understanding, isn't it? We want to get to what is real. The problem with this, though, is that this is just another example of the limited mind in operation. It's the filtering mind, the mind that wants to sort things out. The mind which wants to say, this is good and that is not good. And even when we do this in the name of spirituality, we are still, perhaps even more so, reinforcing the limiting mind. So everything that is happening, we cannot dismiss it as delusion. We do not filter it. We do not deny it. In fact, we go to the complete, the completely opposite end of denial, to total acceptance. There is total acceptance of everything. That's the bottom line. We're told in the next phrase that truth is neither in samskar nor anywhere else. Now the word that we normally get in this context is samsara, not samskara. For example, in chapter 2, page 67 of the translation, there is no nirvana except where is samsara. There is no samsara except where is nirvana. You get this teaching which does not dif differentiate between samsara and nirvana. But here the word is samskara. And at first I thought maybe an error had slipped in. But let's just stick with samskara. Because we're getting to the heart of the matter here. I mentioned how the limiting mind filters. It doesn't just filter, it constructs. This limited mind, which is what we can understand samskara to mean here, is the mind that creates understanding. It's the mind that creates a model for understanding. And that understanding is in accord with our own personal disposition, our own moods, our own pattern of moods. And this term samskara is related to the understanding of what's often translated as habit energy because we're constantly reinforcing our moods. We do this. It doesn't matter if it's a good mood or a bad mood. We hang on to our moods, we reinforce them. They are who we are. So what's being reinforced here is our samskar. So we can just understand samskar as mood here, as mood or moods. 
So although we're told in the first phrase that delusion itself is no more than truth, truth does not abide in delusion. Delusion here is represented by our moods. Because I think it's not so, it's not so difficult to see that reality is different from moods. Truth is different from moods. It might be quite hard to see though that we are actually operating from our moods, from our own psychological disposition. Even if you're a scientist, you'll have your pet theories. The very fact that you are a scientist is an example of your own psychological disposition. So the point here is that our understanding of reality, our understanding of truth is actually nothing more than our own personal preferences. These preferences might be culturally reinforced in one way or another. But we're being asked to look a little bit more deeply here. We're being asked to look from that point where samskara is observed. And what this is indicating here is that there's a point where the moods can be bypassed, where they can be observed. This is the point of awareness. And this is actually very profound. And it occurred to me it's actually a practical benefit of these teachings. It's a question which I've often dismissed of what use are these teachings. And to ask this question seems to me to be missing the point. In fact, there's a little book by Leo Hartung. It looks like quite a nice book. It's called Awakening to the Dream. And he begins his book with this question. Is there a promise in awakening to what I truly am? Is there something I can get out of this that will improve my life? Will it make me a better and more successful person? In short, what will it be like to live an awakened life? For many, the hope for a better life is the core motivation to invest so heavily in this quest. And then he goes on to say that there's a problem with these questions. They originate from the limited perspective that the seeker really wants to transcend. And also, I, I've been actually quite reluctant to have to sell these teachings. If the value of these teachings isn't obvious to you, then it's not up to me to try and sell them to you, to, to promote their value. But I've been finding in my own experience a particular value to them. Because this level, this point at which our moods can be observed, the samskara are observed, we're operating at that point where I believe that hypnotists can get to. We're operating from that point now where we can tinker with our own programming. Which brings me to another theme. The theme of the so-called enlightened personality. I felt a little bit apologetic in the past for not being this charismatic guru figure, beaming radiant bliss. Because it seems to me that that's not what it's about. I've referred in the past to my own 
what I regard as severely dysfunctional personality. Although perhaps being fair to myself, it's probably no more dysfunctional than most other people's. But it seems to me to be like a burning house, the proverbial burning house. I think it's what Gurdjieff calls the terror of the situation. If you can really see the nature of your own personality, it's a terrifying affair. And this point of awareness is that point whereby we can step out from the burning house. We can see what's going on without being burnt by it. We can see the habit energy that fans the flames of this burning house. And we no longer fan the flames because we're stepped outside. We've stepped outside that habit energy, the mood. We don't need to be promoting our habitual anxiety, fears, concerns and all the rest of it. So I would say that this is a very useful thing indeed. It's not an easy thing. This awareness needs to be brutally pursued. I say brutal because we need to be quite, we need to be absolutely sure that there are no elements of our samskara creeping in. It's possible there is still a residual tone there in our awareness, perhaps our fundamental mood tone. So we have to keep applying awareness. We have to keep applying awareness to what is there, to what is here. When we do this, we should eventually be able to discern in this awareness a degree of lightness, of clarity and even of, of bliss. So there's a very definite sequence here. And it's a sequence of enlightenment practice. There's what is going on. There's delusion. We don't have anything to do with it. We recognize it and we step back. We step back. And what we step back into is our moods. And then we step back from that. And when we step back from that, there's awareness. So in this way, we are surveying the triple world. We're surveying the so-called external world, the world of our moods, and the fueling of these moods by the filtering mind by the discriminating mind and if we can see this then we've got at least one foot in awareness and this is what we practice and we can enjoy this awareness